I'm Lois Parr, one of the pastors here at Broadway. Welcome. We're glad you're here. And I want to invite any clergy and people of congregations who are here today to support us as people of faith. Uh, others we've been networking with, Sarah, and others come on up and join us in the chancel today. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dennis Akwuna. I'm one of the coordinators of the Chicago um, LGBT Asylum Support Program, and also one of the co-founders of, um, you know, uh, Courage for Integration and uh, Courageous Living. Um, I want to welcome everybody here today, and um, it's really good to have everybody around, and it's good to have you here to support us in what we are in what we are doing. Um, Today we're going to share uh, with you guys, you know, basically what our program is all about, and you know, the services and programs we carry out within the organization. Ram. So uh, I'm going to talk a bit about CLAPS. You know, uh, CLAPS is, as I said, is Chicago LGBT Asylum Support Program, which was formed in January due to the recent passing of the uh, same-sex prohibition bill in Nigeria, and currently also in Uganda than Russia and India. Uh, because of that, we had a lot of contact from these countries for LGBT asylum people moving to the United States to, you know, to seek for safety. And you know, there was like immediate concentration for Chicago. We had a lot of people who wanted to come to Chicago to, you know, to support, uh, uh, to get a public asylum here in Chicago. So because of that, we came about forming the network of clubs. So in this network, we have uh, two major organizations involved, which is uh, the Center for Integration and Courageous Living, then the Broadway United Methodist Church, you know, which we are all here today present for this press briefing. So in order not to waste too much of our time, uh, I want to introduce uh, our first uh, panelist for today, who is, uh, her name is uh, Reverend, uh, Reverend Lois Parr, if I'm right. Yeah, so she's going to tell us her experience with uh, working with the LGBT community here in Chicago. Thanks, Dennis. Yeah. So just thinking of the, the use of the rainbow, which is all over the neighborhood where I serve, which is right here, but it has also a biblical grounding, right? It's a familiar story of Noah and an ark and a rainbow, and the rainbow that uh, scripture tells us God puts in the sky as a reminder to God to never to never turn away from the creation. And so this is our hope that, I hope that through the power of the internet that people who hear us who are in Uganda, Nigeria, Russia, India, in places where it's not safe, people who feel they've been let down by God, I hope they hear us loud and clear that God loves you with an everlasting love. God will never leave you. And there are people in Chicago to help you understand that loving God and who are ready to help you make a home here. I'm really grateful to my clergy colleagues who are here with me today, uh, an ecumenical collection of folks, Interfaith, uh, Reconciling Ministries Network of the United Methodist Church, Church Within a Church Movement, MCC, Dignity Chicago, uh, UCC, we've got a lot of folks who are here. I probably haven't named everybody who's here, so if you want to uh, catch folks at the end and be sure you have uh, everybody who's here today. I think the significance of having people of faith here is exactly what I said, that people of faith who understand that God made each one of us, God made each one of us good, and God intends for us to have a whole and healthy life. It's our hope that CLASP can be a small way to help make that happen. Thanks for coming today. Okay, so I think that's a very good uh, welcome from Reverend Lois. So in order to waste too much of our time, I'm going to introduce our next uh, speaker. Uh, his name is John Ademola Adewoye. He's a Nigerian gay man resident here in America through the grace of asylum. He came to the U.S. to seek, uh, he came to the U.S. to seek from being gay, but found the freedom to be gay. You know, he is the founder of the Courageous Nigeria and the Center for Integration and Courageous Living, and also a co-founder of CLAPS. 
you know. He, he has since 2006 provided social support to the African LGBT resident here in Chicago and beyond in various ways, in which, which includes counseling, housing, feeding, and social gathering. He also do a lot of uh, referral services to support the LGBT community. You know, his organization is glad to work with the LGBT fan, which is the LGBT Faith Asylum Network. It's a larger network here in the United States that, you know, that, or that is a network of different organizations providing support for LGBT asylum seekers in the United States. You know, and to be part of the experimental project of the LGBT fan here in Chicago, is equally active in the new coalition finding in the new coalition finding solution to the new J the gay law signed into signed by the Nigerian president in January 2014. So he's going to share with us his experience as a gay man in Nigeria before moving to the United States and how fight has been for him since he gained his asylum process here in the United States. So Mr. John. Uh, I came to the United States of America, 1999, and my hidden agenda when I left Nigeria was to seek therapy that would make me straight. I wouldn't say I made a mistake. I was a Catholic priest. I wouldn't say I made a mistake going into the Catholic priesthood. But that was the best option I had that time. And I saw myself in the context of some made themselves eunuch and some were made eunuch. But I was soon realized that it's, it doesn't seem to be applicable to a gay man in the context of my faith tradition. That set a lot of turmoil within me. So when I came to the United States of America, I heard about Exodus uh, International, but arriving here, I could not actually cross to Exodus International for anything because of religious politics and the fact that it would be too obvious what you know, people would question why I would be going there. Well, I met a number of clergy, Catholics, who gave me courage to really see myself not as a condemned creature of God, but as a redeemed creature of God. So my coming to the U.S. to seek freedom from being gay turned around to be freedom to be gay. And uh, reflecting on that, and reflecting on my ministry back in Nigeria, I felt the need to start something that would stop, support the gay community, or anyone who's got some courage to talk about himself or herself. But that was not very acceptable in my faith tradition, at least with the two bishops I discussed it with in Nigeria. And then after my coming out, if I will not do that, I prefer to stay out. That was one reason why I decided to stay in the United States of America. Well, in Nigeria, my life as a gay man was dark. And it was ruled by the passage in Corinthian, First Corinthian, you know, homosexuals and others like them will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And Plus, all the work I was doing, I couldn't just convince myself that I would inherit the kingdom of heaven. And that was what actually prompted my search for the therapy. But it doesn't work. It has not worked. And I feel free to be gay. I feel happy that I am gay. But a number of others, many, many, who find themselves in the same situation, feel trapped. How do we help them? That was what led to the birth of Courage Nigeria. And Courage Nigeria operated principally, thanks be to God, through the internet, connecting with Nigeria and eventually with different countries within Africa. 
Then I discovered the Nigerian gay community in Chicago, and eventually people coming in to seek asylum. Well, I went through the process of asylum. It's not an easy process. You know that you have left everything behind to come here. You know that it, you're not looking back. At least for five or more years, you can go to your own home country. If they can come to you, friends or family members who may still support you, you can go back. You are in a new tradition. So for people not to feel odd, I started welcoming people to my house. I did it within my own meager salary. And I f felt, well, two people. But now, <laughs> I have five people. It's, it, it has, it's becoming overwhelming. And as God will have it, we have clubs that is very you know, resourceful to different groups doing this work. And then I moved from Courage Nigeria to start the Center for Integration and Courageous Living. Not only to help the gay asylees, but with also the focus to continue to support even people back at home. Because I know there is limitation to the number of people who will be able to escape. If a hundred number of gay guys escape Nigeria today, I don't know how many more hundreds will be born gay that day. And for us not to have gay people in the society again, it means, well, maybe you heterosexuals here should have, will have to stop producing babies. So far that is in existence. We, also, we always have gay people. So Center for Integration and Courageous Living is not just looking to feed and house people here, but we're hoping eventually to be able to partner, especially in terms of helping people back at home to be self-sufficient in area of educational support. But today, our focus is welcome the asylees, give them a warm coat and a warm house, let them know there is food, let them know they are in America, the land of freedom, the home of the brave, and let them know here we have homophobic people here too, but the law here affirms them. And that is why we're here. And that is what, why we need your support. And that is what we hope we're going to achieve so that people who have come here will surely and truly free, feel the freedom and gain more confidence, be brave enough to fly. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you so much, Mr. John, for that great speech. You know, I'm really touched. Uh, I'm one of the asylum seekers that probably is, is living in this house right now. So <laughs> we really appreciate the help you're doing for us. And you know, we always say that you're one in a million. You know, out of millions of people, you chose to keep us in your house throughout the process of asylum here in the United States. Thank you so much. Um, just to let you know that, um, just some few facts that there are laws against homosexuality in over 80 countries around the world. You know, 75 out of these countries have uh, laws that probably send gay men and women to prison, and out of which, you know, out of which seven of these countries have, you know, serious laws like uh, stoned to death or death by hanging. I could share an experience that back home in Nigeria, uh, I, was working, I was working with the health sector and one of my major responsibilities was to provide health care services for the LGBT community in the northern part of Nigeria. And you know, the Nigeria, the Nigeria you know, northern side was dominated by the Muslims and they have what they call the Sharia laws. And one of the Sharia laws for people who are found being gay or homosexuals, you know, is to 
you know, so, you know, doing this kind of work in a terrain that doesn't support what you do, and even as a gamer that I am, it was, it was a very risky job I was doing. But at the same time, I wanted to create a positive impact among my community members in, those, in that neighborhood. So it wasn't like easy for me to, you know, to live there with all the threats and the phone calls I had. You know, that was one of the major reasons I have to leave the country because I felt that my life was not at, my, my life was at risk and I needed a safe place to be. And you know, the United States is less homophobic, and which they have laws that at least protect the LGBT community while they live here. So in order to talk more on, you know, experience sharing. You know, um, I would want to introduce uh, another colleague of ours. His name is Victor Aweke. He's an international HIV and human rights voice, seeking to make a significant contribution in pursuing for development among the most at risk population and other communities in the society. He has seven, work, seven years working experience in sexual and reproductive health and human rights issues within Abuja, which is the capital city of Nigeria and other parts of Nigeria, you know. And his activism has brought him to the, uh, his activities have taken him to the United Kingdom where he was able to do some volunteer works and also share his experience working with the LGBT community in that neighborhood. So Victor is going to share with us, you know, his challenges he's faced as a, you know, as, as a healthcare provider in Nigeria and what led to him coming to the United States. Victor. Um, good morning, all. I thank you all for uh, come here. I really want to thank the organizers of this event to have brought us all here. Um, like my my colleague said, my name is Victor, and then I'm a gay man from Nigeria. I arrived to the country on the 14th of February. Um, I've worked with the LGBTI community for a long time now, and the one thing is that I I am also living positively about my HIV status, as in I am HIV positive for more than five years. And what led me becoming a voice is that I am a gay man, and then I also look at the stigma and the discrimination that goes with people being gay and then becoming HIV positive. And so I do think that, okay, if I can be a voice and then make these people feel that no matter your HIV status, you could be anyone you want to be. They might see reasons to live, and that's what we've done over the years. And so that went, that I, I went to the United Kingdom, and then I was talking on trying to inspire people to see reasons with other people, to see reasons to have hope to live, to have hope that God loves them. They are who they are. They can be whosoever they are. In Nigeria, I was working, I've worked for several organizations, and what led me coming to the United States, it's um, that I, w I had a life threat, and then I had to leave my house for more than one month trying to look for where to stay and all of that, because LGBTI community members do come around, they come to my house because of the, the support I give to them. And then I, they, most of them say I inspire them because of I'm open about my sexuality to them, and then my HIV status too. I even say it on the road, I tell people, because it's not easy trying to come out back there in the country. So I, they always come to my house, and some of them, they look feminine, and when they come, the neighbors around will feel that these people are gays. It went on for a while, but at the passing of this bill, it became something that I could not hold anymore. In fact, there was an arrest in my, in my house. They arrested one of my friends, and I had to like escape. And my lawyers, they had to try to get him out and all of that. They were looking for me, so I had to leave for the United States. So one thing I am saying is I am just one person in a thousand that has been able to come here. And then there are others back home that don't have someone to go to or the resources to be able to get to where they want to go to. And so my, my own is that I said I will be a voice for them, that whosoever that is hearing my voice should know the LGBTI communities back in the countries that they are being stigmatized, that God loves them. And my prayer for them is that God will provide safety for them just as he has for me. So thank you very much.
Yeah, um, thank you so much, Victor, for your sharing. Um, just also to hack that uh, stigma and discrimination is something that is very high in Nigeria. And you know, it cuts across every part of Nigeria. You have your own family members, your own parents, you know, train people out of the house when they find out that their kids are gay or their kids are involved in one thing or the other. So it is something that is very high and very, very common in the country. Um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. His name is Andy Ter. And uh, for a very long time, he has been a gay rights activist and anti-war activist who has helped organize most of the city's large anti-war and LGBT rights protests for the last several years, including the May 20th march on the NATO summit and the march of 15,000 people on the Lakeshore Drive when the U.S. invaded Iraq. Mm. Described as a gigantic pain in the butt for the law enforcement by a retired Chicago police deputy uh, commander. He's been arrested numerous times in various protests, including twice in Moscow, Russia, for protesting against the government ban on gay rights demonstration. Adintere is a co-founder of the Gay Liberation Network, a multi-issue LGBT right direct action group. So he's going to share with us his involvement with the LGBT community around the world. So, and it's, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the problem of asylum seekers in our world is not just a Russian problem, a Ugandan problem, a Nigerian problem. It's also a United States problem. One of the greatest shames of US history in the 20th century was the closing off of our borders to asylum seekers attempting to flee Nazi Germany, whether they were Jewish, gypsy, gay, or what have you. That was one of our greatest shames of our US history. And yet, in the last eight years or so, we have been moving dramatically, unfortunately, in the wrong direction. As our world explodes with US-supported coups in the Seychelles and Honduras, as civil wars rage over much of the continent of Africa and the Middle East, we have a problem of people, more people, needing to flee rather than less. And yet the United States, as evidenced in its own statistics, has been dramatically closing our borders to asylum seekers. For the fiscal years covering uh, 2005 to 2009, roughly the second Bush uh, administration, uh, the number of applications for asylum seekers went down 27%. For the fiscal years of 2008 to 2012, they went down 10%. So in both the Bush and Obama administrations, we have been closing our borders to asylum seekers even as the needs have been growing much, much greater. I recently came from Honduras as part of the first LGBT solidarity tour to that country. We learned while we were down there that more than 115 LGBT murdered since the U.S. coup in 2000, the U.S. supported coup in 2009. Now, Honduras, for those who don't know, has a population of about eight and a half million, just a little bit more than, say, the Chicago metropolitan area. How would we, as an LGBT community, as a human community, feel if we had lost 115 LGBT people due to violence, much of it politically motivated, over just the past several years? We would have been crestfallen, and yet the United States, not just through its policies of preventing asylum seekers from coming here, but supporting brutal regimes, whether the Saudi invasion of Bahrain to crush that country's democracy movement, or the, uh, any number of other dictatorships around the world. We are actually making the asylum uh, situation much, much worse in the areas of the world where the United States control. I have no truck with brutal dictators around the world that the United States opposes, but we have got a lot more control over the ones that are allied to the United States government, whether the coup regime in Honduras, the Saudi dictatorship, the uh, Egyptian dictatorship, and so forth. And so 
We have to, as American citizens, be focusing on the problems that we have more control over, what our own administrations are doing, whether they're Democratic or Republican, and that's to stop aid to these brutal regimes, to open up the borders to asylum seekers rather than closing them down. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Andy. Um, in order not to waste too much of our time, uh, I would like to invite um, Reverend Richard Brown. She's the network central. Uh, she's the North Central Network leader, Community Church here in Chicago. So she's going to tell us the involvement with the LGBT community. Thank you. My name is Reverend Rochelle Brown. I am the North Central Network for Metropolitan Community Churches. And what that means is I stand in a legacy of 45 years of helping the LGBTQI communities, communities around the world that have been murdered, and that's just a minimum of what brutalized place. It used to happen here in America. It's still happening globally. We have denied, we are a denomination, and we're working with ecumenical and interfaith partners like this, like CLASP. When it becomes too dangerous for people to stay in their own countries, we work with them to seek asylum. CLASP is looking at a model that was done in Toronto. MCC was very involved, the MCC Toronto Church, with the Canadian government in assisting asylum. We want to see this happen in Chicago. We want to be on the forefront of what's happening to help our brothers and sisters. Today, we stand in solidarity with CLASP. Some of you already know is expansive, it's diverse, and it's social justice oriented. This, we come here and we are called not only to love our neighbor, but our global neighbor. And we are here to stand and make sure comes that they find the asylum they need if it is in this country. Although asylum may be necessary, we have to also say it's not right to rip people from their families, to take them from their communities. And just because they're LGBTQI, that they have to leave we don't want them imprisoned. We do not want them killed. And I know few of them want to leave their countries. But if they must, we must be the people of faith that has the open door and the open arms and use our resources to ensure all are safe. In MCC, what we experienced in our early days of our churches being burned, our people abused, and even our folks murdered, we take that legacy forward and we make sure that the global doors are open and that Chicago sets an example of how we can do this well, whether you're from Nigeria, Russia, India, or any other part of the world. And to this I say, may it be so, and thank you for all of your work. Thank you so much. Uh, I know that uh, leaving one's country is a very big decision we, we, we do make. I know it took me a year plus to decide to leave Nigeria. I know for over one year I was discussing with John, you know, just trying to see the right time for me to move because it was a decision I, that took me a while to make. So I also want to invite um, Reverend Lois back to the stage, you know, I want her to introduce the other people we have on the stage and that we can know them, also know their involvement sure. with the church, you I know. I hope I can get everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so, yeah, let's do it that way. You want to just come by the microphone, say your name and the organization. <laughs> I'm Reverend Sarah Wolub. I'm on staff with the Chicago Religious Leadership Network and coordinate the immigrant welcoming congregations. I'm Reverend Larry Pickens, and I'm a pastor at South Lawn United Methodist Church in Chicago. Uh, Reverend Randall Dubit King, uh, Wellington Avenue United Church of Christ. I'm the Reverend John Hobbs. I'm the pastor of Church of the Three Crosses, which is a duly affiliated United Methodist, United Church of Christ congregation. I'm John Vaukming with Christian Peacemaker Teams and Wellington Avenue United Church of Christ, Minister of Liturgy and Art. My name is Victor Ponce. I'm a member here at Broadway and the Broadway Treasurer. 
I'm Kathy Knight, Executive Director of the Church Within a Church Movement, uh, United Methodist Related Movement. Uh, we hope to be exporting love rather than hate. I'm Reverend Carol Hill, the pastor of Epworth United Methodist Church here in Chicago. I'm Reverend Lila Bukema, and I'm pastor at Lakeview Lutheran Church here in the neighborhood. Reverend Katiana McKay, pastor at United Church of Rogers Park, United Methodist Church. And I'm Reverend Wesley Dorr. I'm a, the deacon at United Church of Rogers Park, United Methodist Church. I'm Fran Holiday, the associate pastor at All Saints Episcopal Church in the Ravenswood neighborhood here in Chicago. I just introduced two other people. Reverend Barbara Zeman is the woman priest who serves Dignity Chicago, and Reverend Andy Oliver is here doing a live uh, feed this morning from Reconciling Ministries Network. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we want to go into the uh, question and ask the question uh, section. So if any of us have any questions for any of our panelists, uh, we could ask questions. 